Hello. Hello. Hello, folks. Hi. Hey, everyone. Hey, everybody. I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, sorry for the rocky start. Uh, tech issues. Um, welcome, everyone, to the official ceremony uh, to anoint the new Vermont State uh, Cartoonist Laureate. Uh, brought to you by the Center for Cartoon Studies here in historic White River Junction, Vermont. My name is Luke Kruger Howard. I'm an uh, alumni and faculty member at the Center for Cartoon Studies. I'm also the illegitimate son of one of the Mythbusters. Dad, if you're out there, can you just please answer one of my letters? Anyway, I don't want to get into that right now. Um, I, right now, I just want to thank all the CCS people out there for all their hard work putting this event together. And especially, I want to thank our sponsors for this event. That's Seven Days and the Vermont Arts Council. If it wasn't for you guys, we would just be having another day where we're sitting on our couch watching Tiger King and stress eating chocolate covered almonds. And so thank you guys so much for giving us a reason to get off our couch and go over to a different part of our couch uh, to have this event. I also want to uh, welcome all the CCS students out there. Hi, students. Um, if you're listening to me right now, I just want you guys to know that we love you this much, which incidentally is six feet or more. Um, that's how much we love you. So thanks for coming. And finally, to the folks out there who, uh, who may just be accidentally watching this because they stumbled across this video while they were trolling YouTube for TikTok compilations or something like that. Thanks for stopping by. We hope you enjoy it. Folks, the year is 2020. Humans know only the indoors and we wear only our sweatpants. It's a hard time. Uh, long gone is the memory of, of the sweet smell of our coworkers' armpits and the only taste that we can still have in our mouths is that taste of breaking news from CNN. But the time has come for us to name the new Vermont Cartoonist Laureate. And that is something that no virus or anything else can stand in the way of. It is the show has to, as they say, 
the show has to continue being a show, as they say. So without any further ado, I want to get that ball rolling. Um, but Luke, I hear you cry. What even is the Vermont Cartoonist Laureate? And I honestly don't know. I'm, I, I can't actually remember what it is. And it kind of sounds made up. It, it might be made up. Um, but just in case it's not made up, I've invited a comic historian, the world-renowned comic historian, an amateur time traveler with us today. Her name is Coco Fox. Uh, please, everybody, welcome Coco Fox, who's going to give us a rundown on what the Cartoonist Laureate is all about. Coco. Hello. Hello, CCS and fellow cartoonist lovers. Here I am going to share with you a brief, brief history of the Vermont Cartoonist Laureate. I'm Coco Fox, and although I myself am not a Vermont Cartoonist Laureate yet, I'm here to share this history of Vermont's most prestigious cartooning honor. Its history is shrouded in mystery, and thanks to my countless hours in the secret archive of the Schultz Library, the story can now be told about how this laureate came to be. In the archive, I came upon a rare scrapbook made by a member of a secret society. And on New Year's Day, they held their annual secret meeting and ice cream social. And it was the only laureates were allowed into this exclusive club. There were Nobel physics laureates. There were poetry laureates. There were even a few Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Oh yes, there were ghosts in attendance. And in the 2011 meeting and ice cream social, Marie Curie, club president, brought a very important issue to the group. Our secret laureate society is missing something. We have poets, doctors, chemists, physicists, and the literary elite, but it feels like we're missing something. A silence came over the laureates. And then a hand shot up. Um, can, can we get some cartoonists in here? Albert, that's a great idea. You're a genius. But then again, we all are. So let's bring a cartoonist into this crazy club. Yeah! Obama, you're not a ghost and you're still president because it's 2011. Can you get a cartoonist laureate position going in the United States? Yes, Madam Curie, and I know just who to call. Operator, get me the Falcon. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Michelle, I have another mission for you and CCS. Yes, Barack, what do you need? I need you to honor a talented cartoonist with a laureate. You're my only hope. Okay, I'll do it, but only because you're my best friend. From her executive office in White River Junction, Vermont, CCS President Michelle Ali called together her dream team. James Sturm, CCS co-founder, can you get us our laureate? Dave Lloyd, operations manager, can you get the Vermont government on board with this idea? The CCS team went off to make this Vermont laureate thing happen. And they came back with their first cartoonist, James Kachalka, superstar. And with the help of Vermont Governor Pete Chumlin and Vermont Arts Council and the Vermont State House, finally on February 11th, 2011, the state of Vermont appointed its first cartoon laureate. <laughs> After three glorious ink slinging years and many diary comics later, James Kachalka passed those laure laurels to Ed Corrin. And Ed Corrin became Vermont's second cartoonist laureate. <laughs> Ed's three-year reign was marked by lots of marks. So many marks, possibly too many marks. Nah, Ed could never have too many marks. And when the ink jar was empty, Ed was ready to pass his laurels on to another cartoonist. This time, it would be Alison Bechdel who would don the laurels as Vermont's third cartoonist laureate. <laughs> As a laureate, Allison showed the world that cartoonists could win every major cultural and arts award in pretty much every dimension possible. Despite all the social distancing, I'm pleased to report that the laurels have been passed in a safe and orderly fashion. 
And that brings us to today. Congratulations, Rich, Rick Veach. You are now part of this proud tradition of Vermont Cartoonist Laureates. Now take your place alongside your brilliant peers in the International Laureate community. Say hi to Madame Curie for me. And thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Back to you, Luke. Thanks, Coco. Uh, that, is, that was a very educational and historically accurate take on what the Vermont Cartoonist Laureate is. And thank you uh, for coming here with us today. Uh, I, you know, folks, I wish that we had the ability to make this official. Normally what we would do is we would go up to Montpelier and go to the courthouse and there'd be a bunch of powdered wig people and they would bang some gavels and read the resolution. And then we would all carry Rick on our shoulders and then they Luke. would- Luke, Luke. Oh, Michelle? You're never gonna believe it. I, I have the resolution. You have the resolution? I have the resolution. And I'm gonna actually, this is, since this is such an extraordinary um, circumstance, as the president of CCS, I'm gonna exercise my executive powers granted by the Cartoon Studies Constitution and will read the resolution and appoint the next cartoonist laureate. So do you have some slides, Luke? Whereas Vermont is enriched by diverse by the diverse creative talents of artists who live among its citizens as neighbors, colleagues, and friends. And whereas Vermont has been home to numerous nationally and internationally recognized cartoonists who enhance the quality of life in our state. And whereas the state of Vermont has recognized and promoted the artistic talents of our state's cartoonists by designating four cartoonist laureates. And whereas Rich Veach began his publishing career in Vermont, cartooning for the University of Vermont's, the Vermont Cynic, and continued his practice as part of the underground comics movement. Whereas Rick graduated as part of the pioneering class of the Joe Cooper School of Cartooning and Graphic Art in 1978, and then launched a career that would have him working on such iconic characters as Sergeant Rock, Swamp Thing, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and in such publications as Heavy Metal and Epic Illustrated. Whereas he continued to hone his own unique vision and he wrote and drew groundbreaking comics and graphic novels, including Harpburst, The One, Brat Pack, Maxi Mortal, Can't Get No, Army at Love, The Big Lie. Whereas Rick Veach, prolific as he is legendary, continues to create superbly crafted fiction and nonfiction educational comics. And whereas in celebration of cartooning's importance in the Vermont's artistic and cultural landscape and in recognition of the arts forms communicative power, the Center for Cartoon Studies of White River Junction with enthusiastic support of the Vermont Arts Council and Governor Phil Scott has designated Rick Feach, a native son of Bellows Falls, Vermont, longtime resident of West Townsend, Vermont, and highly acclaimed and visionary cartoonist as cartoonist laureate. And whereas for the three term, for the three year term, he will continue to wield his pen to reflect on the human condition as only a cartoonist can. And whereas Rick Feach has enjoyed his impressive career while living and being inspired by the Green Mountain State and embodies the essence of the Vermont cartoonist laureate tradition. Now therefore be it. Resolved by the General Assembly and, and who now congratulates Rick Feach on his designation as the fourth cartoonist laureate. May your ink flow freely. Yay! Yay! Hey, Michelle, thanks so much for doing that. Uh, and I, I just want to get into it. I want to I want to bring Rick on here. Rick, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Rick. Uh, congratulations for for becoming the the fourth Vermont cartoonist laureate. It uh, it's such a huge honor to have you be a part of our state. Um, and your body of work is just so uh, 
so impressive and it's just um, an honor to be a witness to that journey. And now to, uh, to have this ceremony where we get to sort of put your name into the, the kind of state hall of fame as it were um, and, um, and kind of honor you in that way. I'm wondering how it feels for you to, uh, to officially become a Vermont state uh, cartoonist laureate. Well, I'm really proud of my state that they would see fit to honor the coolest art form of all time. Uh, growing up as a kid, I don't know if you're, you know, before you were a kid, comics were seen as things for morons and everything's changed now. Uh, I think comics take their place, uh, rifle place with all the rest of the great arts that civilization has provided us with. And is there something specific about being a cartoonist in Vermont that you feel like uh, has, has been important to you? Well, for me, it's nature. Getting to live uh, in a place where there's trees and fields and uh, plants and stuff really makes a big difference on my quality of life. I just, I'm not someone who can survive in a city. I think it's interesting because the state we live in, Vermont, it's a, it's a pretty low populated state as far as states go. Uh, but per capita, we seem to have an impressive amount of cartoonists. And just looking at the roster of past cartoonist laureates, uh, it's, it's just crazy that all of them happen to call Vermont home. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> um, now, Rick, there is one thing that I feel like is missing. I'm looking at the top of your head and it's, it's looking a little blank. Um, it's and been I that way for about 10 years, man. Yeah, I mean, there's that, but also I just feel like maybe there's something else that, that needs to get done, uh, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Can you help me out here? Well, we went to laureate.com and we ordered up a set of laurels. Um, it was a kind of a rush, so I don't know if they're going to fit right, but we have a set of laurels here to place upon my brow. Can we go ahead? Yes, let's do it. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick, didn't I, didn't I hear you had some sort of scepter? Oh yeah, I got my scepter here. Um, would you be willing to just sort of bless all of us cartoonists with your your newfound laureate powers i would i would like to bless all of our imaginations with creativity ideas and spirituality and all those good things and odomino you, you know rick one of the things that we uh we tried to do with this is get the past laureates to come along so that they can sort of uh help welcome in the new cartoonist laureate and because we had to cancel the event uh in in the traditional sense and move this to a virtual experience it was it was sad to think that we might not be able to get you all together but if i'm correct i think some of those past laureates have joined us today and i'm wondering if i could just invite them to come on and and say a few things uh, in support of Rick. Um, so why don't we start with, it? do we have James Kilchaka in the house? James? What about Allison? I see you there. I'm here. Hey, Allison. Hi. Hi, Luke. Hi, everyone. Hi, Rick. Hi. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Whew, I feel like a great weight has been lifted from my brow. This is amazing. <laughs> and I see Ed Corn. Ed, is that you? That is me, ready with my ancient laurels that was presented to me six years ago and has not based, really stood the test of time, although they have matured as all pine laurels. This was presented to me by a wonderful student teacher of at CCS six years ago as a pine, fresh pine laurel wreath. And it is now, as you can see, um, a bit dry, but it's here. And I keep it as a constant reminder of, all, of the honor and, and the responsibility that we all have to mainly be ourselves. We have to take an oath 
an oath of office, which I, Rick, you, you I think will might have to take as well. I'm not sure. You may be spared this, but, <laughs> but the, the oath is very simple. It is simply, I promise solemnly to honor my imagination and my skill and my art, and along with that, the state of Vermont. So I toast you with my scepter and my bottle of ink. Thank you, Ed. You don't look quite as fuzzy as you do in your comics. Well, that's because I've got the same paint you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's Ed, fuzzy is the laurels. That, that, that will do it. <laughs> yeah, Ed, I want to recommend that you stay away from any open flames with those laurels because it could be a disaster. I've got my fire truck outside that will take care of it all. So, Ed, Ed and Allison, do, you, do either of you have any sage bits of wisdom or anything else you'd like to say to Rick um, as he launches on his journey uh, into the, the world of being a laureate? Allison, you, me? Uh, I am only glad that it was an honorary post given how little I did for it. <laughs> Um, and I hope that, uh, Rick, you will do better than I did in that post. Well, I share that same uh, caveat with Allison. And um, I did, uh, I think I honored the post by simply working and continuing on the path that uh, maybe led me to the royal or unroyal society of cartoonist laureates. So um, I, I did a few talks here and there, uh, but that's about it. And except for being honored and honoring the state and being of service that way and through the work I do. Well, that sounds great. And that's exactly how I wanna proceed with this great honor. Well, thank you to the past laureates for being here today. It's a real honor to have you. And congratulations again to Rick. Um, it's it's so great to know that we have the Vermont cartoonist uh, ship with you at the helm right now. I think I think it's it's a perfect choice uh, for us. And I want to lead us into a bit of a conversation about your career um, and get to know you a little better now that you are officially the laureate. Um, I don't. I don't feel like I'm as equipped as uh, my colleague, Steve Bissett, who has known you for so many years. I wanna invite him over to kind of interview you and, and let's just have you guys talk for a little bit about, about all things Rick. Steve, you there? I am here. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can okay, see you, great. we can hear you. I am here. Um, Rick, are you ready to uh, chat a little bit about yourself? Shoot. Okay, shoot. I'll take that as a yes. So, <laughs> uh, Rick, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, with the time in which you and I met. Um, and I want to start there in part because when you and I met in the fall of 1976, um, we met at a time when uh, the comics industry and actually uh, certain parts of the American infrastructure were completely collapsing <laughs> under very different circumstances than today. Um, and so it somehow seems perversely appropriate that you and I are here talking right now in the midst of a pandemic uh, about uh, cartooning because that's what we were doing when we first met and the crap had hit the fan in so many ways back then. Um, so uh, um, what were your, <clears throat> first impressions of um, the Cubert School, uh, which is where you and I met in Dover, New Jersey back in September 76. It was a complete buzz. Um, you know, I kind of spent my life struggling to make comics with a lot of negative reinforcement from the adults in my life up to that point, who um, just didn't understand what a cool art form comics were. Um, you know, growing up in the 60s, uh, they still had the the whiff of Dr. Wortham, uh, and they were kind of seen as a as a reading thing for idiots and morons. But I 
grew up during the 60s, you know, I plugged into those Marvel comics when they started coming out. And so I was totally inspired. Um, meeting Joe Kubert, you know, I was completely amazed at uh, him as a person. First off, because he was so young looking, he had been in the golden age. So I was assuming he was in his 60s or 70s. Turned out he was in his 50s because he had started at the age of 12, I believe. And uh, he looked like he was 35 because he was so young. Um, and that first meeting with him where he went through my portfolio was just a life-changing experience. And then coming to the school and meeting you and Toddleben and Yates and uh, Tim Truman and the whole gang, it was like, uh, I was just, I'd finally found my place in this world. And oddly enough, that place was Dover, New Jersey, my friend. <laughs> it was, it was, but it was like the, the school was set up in a mansion on five acres of forests and land with a swimming pool set away from Jersey. So we were in our own little, you know, X-Men kind of place or something, you know? Yeah, it was kind of like uh, Harry Potter going to, to Hogsworth or something. So. Yeah, it definitely was. It definitely uh, was. And Joe became your mentor. I mean, I won't say he was your first mentor because in a way, Big Daddy Roth publishing your name in Big Daddy Roth comics was one of your lifelines from Bellows Falls, Vermont to Dover, New Jersey. But Joe really uh, became a mentor for you. Um, he helped us all begin in our careers. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, you've talked about meeting Joe, uh, about how you uh, developed that relationship with Joe. Well, he was just so open and giving. Um, he was a true gentleman. And, uh, uh, you know, I haven't told this story often, but when I first went to the school, I, I didn't have any money. And uh, I was had applied for a grant to go there, but the grant was not going to be um, announced until sometime in late October. And in September, I called him and I said, gee, I don't have the money to go to the school. And Joe said to me, you know, I've been talking to Muriel about you. You come down here, we'll figure something out. Yep, Muriel being Muriel Cuber, <laughs> Joe's wife. And, and Muriel did a lot of the nuts and bolts administration work at the school. That's right. But they were very generous with what they did. It, it, um, it, it was such a changing point in my life to meet people like that, who gave of themselves, who recognized that creative spirit and helped, you know, kindle that flame. Um, so, uh, you know, I, Joe, wherever you are, thank you. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about that grant, too, because that was a grant from the state of Vermont, as I recall. And yep. the, the, the boost up that uh, Joe and Muriel gave in extending the time that was needed for the grant to go through, but also the fact that the state of Vermont had such a grant at the time, um, not only helped you, but Rick, in my friendship with you, it boosted my career. Um, and, and actually seeded the lives and the, um, uh, the past of a lot of other cartoonists and creative people in your circle. It wasn't a Vermont grant. It was a federal grant. It was a Comprehensive Employment Training Act. CETA. I apologize. Thank you. Um, it was originally designed to train people to be like plumbers and sewage treatment plant operators. But when I went down to visit Joe the first time, Muriel told me about this possibilities of this grant. And she had read the whole act. And she said, you know, some smart guy could make this work to go to cartooning school. And I took that as gospel. And uh, even though it was a federal grant, it was administered by the state. And so I kind of worked my way up through the state hierarchy until I got to uh, the lady who ran it. I, I don't remember her name in Montpelier. Um, I had a lot of samples to show them, but they were completely open uh, to this idea. Um, the lady, I remember when she called me um, to look at, uh, and she had looked at the stuff and she looked at my samples and she said, I see a lot of super men here, but I don't see any super women. And I said, that's what I need to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well played, Rick. Well played. <laughs> but, you know, you're right. It, it, it didn't just help me, you know, and, and give me a career and a life that, you know, I'm just so happy and lucky to, to have had. But uh, it, it spread out among the people around me, around the businesses around me. I made money not only for myself, but also for publishers, distributors, comic book stores, filmmakers. So 
um, it's kind of a thing that I like to to suggest to people that hey, this is a good thing that we got to do for our kids. Instead of sending them to college and uh, send, you know, putting chains on them with college debt, why don't we pay and put them in school and set them free, give them the training they need because it's a really great investment in our society, not just in the kid. Yeah, and I, uh, I again will assert that if I hadn't met you, um, uh, I, I wouldn't have had the life I've had here in Vermont, making my living creatively. Um, and I, I also have to say that I wouldn't have gone to the school if it weren't for the underground comics work you did. It was really you and your brother Tom's two-fisted zombies, your brother Tom Veet, uh, that uh, gave me the confidence to even apply to go to the Kubert School. In a way, we had met through your work before we ever got to see each other face to face and shake hands and say hi, so. I think you were the first person I ever met who actually bought the comic. <laughs> yeah, I didn't shoplift it, I actually did buy it, it's true. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna weave into our conversation some of the questions that the Center for Cartoon Studies um, students had and a few other folks, so we'll keep going with the thread. Uh, one of the questions um, that was asked that I wanna bring in now, Rick, if you're okay with it, is, uh, uh, who were some of the non-cartoonists who inspired uh, you to do comics and have inspired your work to this day? You know, writers, musicians, whatever. Oh, jeekers. You know, I grew up in the 60s, so all the great musicians, you know, the Beatles and Dylan and the Beach Boys and, you know, Zappa, Beefheart, all that stuff. Um, I, you know, I didn't go to college until I went to Kubert School, so I kind of missed out on a lot of the literary education, and I was always catching up with my reading and stuff. But, um, you know, I went through all the adventure authors and stuff. And then I kind of went on to the literary guys, you know, like Henry Miller. Um, and uh, I, I found that um, I was always looking for uh, an interesting voice in a writer, someone who could uh, had like a rhythm and uh, a richness to it. And I realized now that there was a connection between those kinds of writers and the writers of comics because the best comic book writers use those kind of tricks. Um, so. Yeah, and I also want to make clear to the folks that are tuned in um, who might not be familiar with the career is that um, you've carved out as much of a career as a comics writer as you have a comics artist. I mean, you're being honored as Vermont Cartoonist Laureate, but one of the things about the kind of cartooning we do is we're storytellers. and. Um, uh, you, you know, I'd say a good third of your career is writing and working with other people. And of course, most of your own creator owned work, you're writing and drawing, you're doing, you're doing everything. Yeah. And it goes back to being a kid and having my own little line of comic books. You know, I have my little Sun comics, was it? Sun was comics. Sun comics. Yeah. And um, making comics, writing and drawing became an organic part of who I am. If I hadn't gotten that grant and I hadn't been able to actually do it professionally, I think I always would have felt like I was a failure. You know, it was, a, it was that deep a, a central part of who and what I was. So that I, I'm a very fortunate and blessed person to have gotten where I got. Uh, one of the questions I got hit with to pass on to you is, uh, is there a book or books that you would recommend to any aspiring uh, Vermont cartoonists or cartoonists anywhere right now? I mean books in terms of training or just books to read? Uh, yeah, both. Oh, jeekers, I don't know. You know, Joe Kubert uh, has, has this whole set of uh, how to cartoon. You must have seen these, right? These oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, he, he knocks it out of the park. He'd been working on the curriculum at Kubert School since the 50s. He, he'd had that germ of an idea with one of his partners to start an online course. And he had put together like what needed to be taught and how. So when you and I got there at the school, it was all there. He had a complete curriculum set up. Uh, pretty amazing how, how quickly he put the, pulled all that together. But I would, anybody who wants to do comics, I would recommend getting that set. You're the best. Um, Rick, I'm also gonna ask, um, what is it that inspires you to create comics? You know, what is it inside you that drives that? I don't know. I just know it's there. <laughs> um, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm 68 years old, and I wake up in the morning and I think, oh boy, I get to draw comics today. You know, still, 
there's I don't know what it is, Steve, but um, it's it's a lovely thing. You've also uh, are drawing comics when you're not awake. <laughs> um, you you know a big part of your of your comics career, especially since the mid '90s when you got to launch your own self publishing line with Roaring Rick's Rare Bit Fiends, has been you sharing with a readership your dreams, your studying of your dreams. And I'm also wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about how your how your dreams have affected your your creative process, uh, including earlier in your career before you were actually doing the dream comic. Well, I've been doing dream work seriously since I was about 20 years old. And uh, it began when I sort of uh, kind of like uh, overdid it as a young man and it kind of fell into a state of depression. I could hardly get out of bed. Um, and I started having uh, these powerful nightmares, you know, in dreams, which were so strong that I started writing them down. Um, and uh, I began to study what dreaming was and how um, one could use one's dreams to center oneself. Um, dreaming is psychologically is sort of like the keel of a boat. It helps keep us straight and steady. And uh, I learned really quickly that, you know, paying attention to dreams and sort of um, incorporating them in, in, into my uh, daily life uh, healed me. It made me a better person. And I, I always wanted to bring that into comics. It took me like another 20, 25 years before I, you know, really pushed it and started doing rare bit fiends. Um, but I think out of all the things I've done, um, it's, it, to me, it's the most important and most fulfilling. Not to get too Jungian here, you're, you're the friend that turned me on to Carl Jung. Uh, how does that process differ for you between drawing images from your dreams versus drawing images from your waking imagination? Well, because dreams are kind of like a message from the deep self, at least to me, uh, that kind of come to heal us and help us figure out how to go forward in life. And so the, uh, to understand them, you use your intuition. And now when I sit down and draw, uh, art is total intuition. And so you mix those two together, you know, a dream and art, and it'll take you places that uh, you've never thought of before. I re highly recommend it to everybody to create art from your dreams and you will understand them by better, you'll integrate them better into your lives and you'll be a better person. And how's that different from the kind of work you're doing, you know, whether it's when you were writing, you know, Swamp Thing or The Question or right now with your boy Max Immortal series, you know, how is, how is that process different for you when you're working in the waking time with um, creating work from your, your waking imagination? Well, I have to take the time to sit down and write it, where with a dream, it's just taking notes. <laughs> yeah, good point, good point. And so, like what I would do with the dreams is I would take the notes and put them across my drawing board, you know, tape them to the top of the drawing board and look at them and you'd see how the dream I had Tuesday was connected to the dream I had Friday and pull, pull those things together and craft those into a page of comics. Um, Rick, you've worked in a lot of different genres. I mean, when you and I started out at the Kubert School, you came in having done some underground comics work. We ended up doing war stories in the back of Sergeant Rock as some of our earliest mainstream work. And since then, I think you've worked in every genre that exists except maybe Archie comics, but I know you've done parodies of comics like that. Um, what, what genres come to you the most naturally um, and in working with these different genres, do you think this benefits you creatively to be shifting gears all the time? It does. It, it's the best thing you can do, I think, is to jump from uh, thing to thing. Uh, it freshens it up. Um, I think there are other genres out there that I haven't hit yet. Um, in the last few years, I've, I've focused on educational comics. Um, you remember at Kubert School when uh, Will Eisner came to visit and he told yeah. us, you know, two things. One was graphic novel and the other was educational and informational comics. These were the two things that were coming. And uh, it took me a number of years to get to it. But now a, a, a big part of my focus is doing educational comics and informational comics, which I consider a great challenge to use our art form to describe uh, uh, information and stories of other people that have nothing to do with me at all. Yeah, and some of those educational comics are you're actually doing 
uh, textbooks and graphic novel form in projects where you're working with Steve Connolly uh, yes. and uh, your sons, Ezra and Kirby. Um, and this has ended up being a significant part of the work that funds your being able to do your self-published work as well. Exactly. Um, it pays a heck of a lot better than regular comics. Um, you, you usually have like a two or three month heavy work period, uh, make a bunch of dough, and then you've got six months off to do whatever's in your crazy mind. And so I'm able to do uh, comics that are that uh, free of any monetary worries, free of any editorial structure, anything. I can, I can create comics that are uh, as pure of an art form as I can make. Uh, and that was how I always imagined it was going to be when we were kids. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that's how we imagined it when we were kids. But both you and I cut our teeth and, and scraped some knuckles on working in the, the so-called mainstream industry, meaning DC Comics, Marvel Comics. Um, uh, let me ask a couple of questions that people uh, requested I field uh, with you. You both uh, illustrated and wrote uh, at different times, different characters. So let's just focus on Swamp Thing for a moment. Did you prefer writing or drawing Swamp Thing? And what were some of the challenges of switching your roles uh, when you were working on a book like that? I can't say I prefer one over the other, but I do prefer doing both. Um, I get the most out of it. Um, just in terms of the creative process, it's the most satisfying. Um, you know, I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, well, you and I learned a lot working with writers, though, too. I mean, you know, <laughs> when we were first getting in, if we got a script by, you know, a, a Robert Kaniger and Archie Goodwin, we felt like we were on cloud nine. And and we both got the benefit from working uh, collaborative relationships with Alan Moore, you in particular, because you and Alan continued working for, for decades. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, to work with Alan, you learn a lot. You know, the guy's got so much going on. But I go, again, I go back to Kubert School. Uh, Joe had talked about having a writing component to the, to the school, but he realized once we were in there for after six months that he couldn't do it. Um, but he brought in these outside gigs, the, the Sergeant Rock stuff, the backup stories. And he uh, brought me along and helped me learn how to actually craft and write a script. And of course, at the same time, I'm looking at Kaniger, who was one of the great masters. And uh, one of my first jobs was lettering Archie Goodwin scripts. And Archie was another one who just really knew how to get comics right. So I had, I had a, lot of, a lot of help along the way. Archie Goodwin also uh, became sort of a mentor for you because you and Archie had quite a healthy relationship where you were creating work when Archie was editing a line of uh, comics, uh, the Epic Comics uh, and the Epic Magazine, Epic Illustrated. Um, uh, so, I mean, what was it, if, if I, you had to say one thing you took away from the relationship with Archie, what would it be? Boy, it would be like, choose your editors carefully. <laughs> that Archie was, again, one of those gentlemen who, uh, yes, he worked for a company, but he really tried to help people. He really tried to bring people forward um, and help them fulfill themselves within their vision. He wasn't out to exploit people. Um, and I got to say, you know, uh, like Joe, Archie is one of those people in heaven. I go, thank you, Archie. You've also gotten to work collaboratively with lots of other creative people. And one of our students asked if you had any advice on how to work with other artists and writers. How to work with other, boy, I think every situation is different. Um, um, it's almost like making music. And you and I have sat in a room and made comics together. And you know, it's just like a great feeling of when it's really going right. It's almost it's like a couple of people making music. And, you know, everything kind of rises up uh, as, as this creative force. You know, vision ends up on the page. Um, that's what I'm always looking for. Um, you can't always get that with everybody, but it seems like there are so many different ways into doing comics that you always learn something, no matter who you're working from. Um, I also wanted to ask what your workday looks like now versus what your workday was like, say, 20, 25 years ago. Is there anything you do now that um, 
saves a lot of time, re relieves stress, uh, or have you just eased into sort of a sweet spot in terms of your working life? Well, in the early days, it was, you know, workaholic time. If you're working on a monthly book, you know, you're putting in eight to 10 hours a day easy if you're doing it right. If you're not, then you're, you know, working all night and stuff to make these deadlines, which is, is tough. But, you know, when you're a young man, you do it. Um, I've got my, the, my own rituals of how I approach the day and the number of hours I spend at the board now um, than, than I used to. I have to say also that I've assimilated working digitally. Uh, you know, I've got a Cintiq now and that uh, saves a lot of time, especially for a reference artist like myself. You know, I always had thousands of books around so, so I knew how to draw stuff. Uh, now it's right there in the computer to help you. Um, and the software that uh, is available is, is just extraordinary now. So uh, I'm really loving the digital age. Um, I also had a question from somebody who, in the context of the Swamp Thing issue, where you were going to have Swamp Thing meet Jesus in the garden, <laughs> and the you know censorship uh, debacle that that uh, revolved around that, uh, the person asks. Um, uh, for us cartoonists who are about to face a world full of acceptance, rejection, a little bit of both, do you have any advice on how to deal with this stuff? <laughs> that was their wording. Well, you have a choice. Either you can kowtow and sort of do what they say, or you can stand up for your ideals. And that's for good or for ill, that's what I did. I stood up for my ideals. Um, you know, I kind of paid a price for that because I was working my way up the DC hierarchy of creators at that time and uh, but I had to I had to stand and, and say no this this isn't right um, and I think at that point you know I, I kind of got cut out of the uh, professional the top end professional cartooning uh, which was also a blessing because that pushed me in a direction of, of focusing on stuff that was really important to me or you um, and stuff that I owned, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. And yeah. that's, all, that's been really good. Wow. Um, you and I came in, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, to wind things up. You know, you and I came in when when things were really in, uh, collapsing and floating around us. I, you and I both remember the, the long gas lines in New Jersey and fist fights that were happening and, uh, you know, out on the streets. And there we were. We were able to just sort of bunk up wherever our drawing board was. <laughs> And, and pour into our work. So um, uh, we're, you're, you're talking now to a group of individuals uh, who are shut up in their home because of a pandemic. And you're also talking to a group of cartoonists, including our students who uh, are about to enter a, a comics industry that every day in the news, we're seeing how you know, different distribution modes and so on are, are collapsing. Um, but you and I learned going into that kind of environment that reinventing ourselves um, was uh, not only vital and a survival tool, but actually um, it was something we thrived within. So do you wanna talk a little bit about how you are engaging with the reinvention of yourself over the past few years with print on demand and alternative online distribution? Um, yeah, well, first I would wanna address that when you and I graduated from Cubert School, the comics industry was in complete collapse. The old method of distribution was failing. Uh, DC Comics had uh, just canceled half their line. Uh, there was no work for the old timers, much less the young people. Um, but the system reinvented itself really quickly. And, and the replacement system was really great for about 10, 12 years. The 80s for comics are like the 60s of music. There were 14 or 15 distributors all fighting for retailers uh, orders and they were open to small publishers who had vision and moxie and were willing to get out there with their comics. This all kind of closed down in the early 90s and what we're seeing today is the collapse of that direct sales market. I don't think it gets up off the floor after what we're seeing in the last couple of days. So, um, I would say to the young folks, take heart and uh, look at the system, look at it, what you wanna do, and then try to help the system reboot itself in a way that will 
encourage and incorporate the grassroots of cartooning because that's really where the strength of what we do lies. Um, when Marvel and DC and Diamond take over uh, the whole comic book art form, it's not good for anybody. And we're right at the end of that right now. So it's time to reboot guys. And you're living that example. I mean, I can point to a half dozen uh, pieces of new work that you've done, Rick, over the last, what, year and a half that you have completely uh, created uh, in your studio, working sometimes with your sons, you know, Ezra and Kirby, um, and you're uh, putting them out directly through Amazon, which is serving as both your printer and your distributor. Um, and uh, this says to me that this decentralization of distribution really is a positive future for comics. Um, is, how's that working for you? It's working good for me, but I don't know if you could say Amazon is decentralization because um, you know they're as bad as uh, Diamond and DC, uh, maybe worse. Um, I think what's needed are regional dist distributors again, you know, a bunch of them that are fighting for those orders from retailers and doing a good job in uh, carrying more and more product. And I think that's the answer to it because the trick in American cartooning is to just get all that creativity that's happening out onto the stands. Right now, for, for the last 15, 20 years, it's been blocked and it's just waiting to blow. Yeah. And some of the real decentralizing actually is crowdfunding and those means of getting new work out where people are promoting and distributing the work themselves uh, prior to it even you know, being a physical book in someone's hand. Absolutely. Yeah. You can see it already forming up. But um, I just feel bad for the retailers. You know, there's a couple thousand retailers left and I don't know how many are going to last what's going on like today. Yeah, yeah. And you're trying to work with those that are willing to work with you. So I do want to put that out there that you're still oh, yeah. setting a positive role model. Um, oh yeah, you, you try to, but um, the way the system was set up is they just don't have time to deal with everybody. They, it, it's like they're being picked apart by thousands of small self publishers. Um, the key to it is more dis distributors. That's the key. And each distributor fights for the order from the retailer. Right. Well, I know you've only been cartoonist laureate 30 minutes, Rick, but I've got a last trio of questions that relate to that. Are okay. you ready? Hit me. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of our uh, current students asks, does being named the cartoonist laureate change how you see your work now? Um, you know, I thought about that when it happened and I thought, oh man, I've got to like, you know, be more straight. I can't, <laughs> you can't be outrageous now, but uh, you know, I think I'm going to be outrageous. Yeah, I know you're going to be outrageous. <laughs> um, he also asks, does it inspire you to create more comics? And if so, what kind do you think they'll be? Um, I don't, I don't need fresh inspiration. I'm still hard, hard at it. Um, my wrist is holding up, you know, I can still make it work. Uh, my back's holding up. My eyes, I got them fixed. So, you know, I don't need more inspiration. I'm there. What's the current work that you're doing right now, Rick? Right now, I'm just uh, working on the next issue of Rarebit Fiends, number 24. And so uh, I'd like to call out to all my CCS student friends. Uh, we're looking for dream comics. Oh, you know what? They've got some. Well, I'm your guy. Okay. You hear that, CCSers? Send your dream comics to Rick. Rick, that leads to the last two questions I got. One is from somebody who asks, how do I get started and how do I send you fan art? <laughs> uh, you know, email is great. And you can find me, you know, through Facebook or, uh, you know, I got a website with my email on it. That's the way to get started. Okay. I, I can't say I'll respond, but. <laughs> okay. And finally, uh, best advice to the youth of America out there that are making marks right now. I can honestly attest to you, Rick. I think there are more young kids drawing comics today than ever before. It's really changed this landscape we live in. It's really changed. Well, first off, the advice is keep doing it and you know, don't lose heart. Second advice is if you want to make a living, the place where the money is in terms of cartooning right now is in educational and informational comics taking on corporate clients to tell their stories, use our tools. Um, it, it pays double, three times 
what uh, your rates would be if you had the best DC rate going. So that would be my recommendation to anybody getting into the field. Uh, Luke, I think I'm going to turn back over to you. Rick, is there anything you want to say before you and I? Uh, oh, well, I did have one la last question. Somebody asked how you put up with me. So I guess I better put that out there. <laughs> uh, how do you put up with the mofo, if I may paraphrase? <laughs> well, the mofo. Well, I think the first thing I do is I don't get personal. And I don't ask about your relationship to your mother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Bless her memory. Uh, <laughs> Steve right. and Rick, I, I, I just want to thank you guys both so much for giving us a, an entertaining uh, glimpse into your lives. Um, I, you know, you're both uh, legends in the comics community, but I just want to point out, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you guys might be old enough to run for president finally. So, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have a cartoonist in the White House. So anyway, consider it. Um, Rick, we, I wish I could like pop a cork of some champagne, but uh, we don't have anything like that. Um, it unless... just so happens. We popped the cork a few minutes ago, so you're not going to hear the pop, but we All have right. the champagne. Well, here, let me, I got a LaCroix. <laughs> so let me, I'm going to pop the LaCroix. Yeah. And then here's to you, Rick. Here's to you. I'm going to, cheers, cheers. And here's to all who ply the inky trade. Um, Rick, thank you so much. It's It's been an honor to spend some time with you. I want to thank one last time all the other laureates who were able to join us today. Um, you have proved without a shadow of a doubt that, uh, that laurels can be fashionable. Uh, to CCS, a school that was founded by a cartoon character that is fictional, but somehow manages to be real every day. Uh, to our sponsor, Seven Days, who happens to own all the days of the week. Congratulations on that, Seven Days. Vermont Council uh, to the Arts. Uh, Vermont Arts Council, do you have art that needs counseling? Call us at Vermont Arts Council. And to the CCS students, uh, you look great in hats, and I just want to encourage you to continue to wear hats uh, while you make the amazing comics that you make. Rick, it's been an honor. Congratulations on, on this great achievement. Um, and we look forward to seeing more work from you now as the, the infamous cartoonist laureate. Thank you. Cheers. All right, folks, thanks so much. We're gonna end the live feed now. Um, and we really appreciate you being with us. Take care of yourselves out there, wash your hands, wash your underwear, all that sort of stuff. Stay busy. We love you. <laughs>